Hi friends, welcome to Radiant Church Online. We are so glad you decided to worship with us. I'm Timothy, I'm one of the pastors, and we just want you to experience God's presence. So a little preview, the service will last 70 to 75 minutes. It's gonna be a time of vertical worship and a time in God's word. So if you're at home, feel free to raise your hands and worship. If you're in your car, I wouldn't recommend it. You can sing along with us. But go ahead and get your Bible ready, and now let's get our heart ready. Father, as we worship you, we just pray that your Spirit would meet us wherever we're at, whether we're driving in the car, whether we're in our home, that we would just sense your presence in our midst. So Lord, speak to our hearts now and bless this time of worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Radiant Church. Let's get, let's get these lights back on. I'm afraid you guys may fall asleep. It's so relaxed in here, isn't it? Well, we want to welcome you. For those of you who are guests, I would love to meet you after the service. Um, we have a Radiant resource room down the hallway, and uh, just love to get to say hello and meet you. Again, I'm one of the pastors here. We want to welcome those watching online. This is a very special Sunday. This is a Sunday where we start a new chapter in our church's rich history. We're not quite 70 years old, but we're getting there. And um, God has done so many things through our past. And we stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before and just want to acknowledge those who helped build this church and all that they've done. Let's, let's give them a round of applause. So next week we'll be back in Revelation. So wanted to kind of do a standalone vision message for this Sunday being the first Sunday. And a few opening remarks about the rollout of Radiant. Uh, for those of you just joining us, we're doing kind of a soft rollout that's gonna to lead to a grand opening. If you notice, a lot of the things still say Arden First Baptist on it, like the bulletins and other things. So we're gonna slowly change things over. And uh, we are also raising money for a new sign out front. We have a temporary sign, which they did a great job on that. And uh, but we're, we're hoping to, by September, have everything in place with the new permanent sign, uh, everything through the building changed over, so that's going to take a few months. So just be patient with us as we switch over email addresses and bulletins and whatnot. So if you do want to give to the Vision Fund, it's just uh, Radiant Fund. Uh, so those of you who have asked uh, what, what I make that out to, over and above your normal giving. And by the way, as of this Sunday, you can start making tithes and offerings out to Radiant Church. So... It's exciting. We're going to be in Isaiah 43, so go ahead and turn there. As you turn there, I wanted to give a little testimony. Uh, for some of you I haven't had a chance to have coffee with, um, just kind of wanted to share a little bit from my heart. And the theme of my testimony is God is always working behind the scenes, even when you often can't see him work. So I was born as the youngest of six kids, and my parents go to church here, Janice and Leon here at the front. And... Um, it, it was amazing growing up in the household. They really taught us Christian values. And so my parents led me to faith at a really young age, kind of like my children. I was five years old when I became a Christian. But from the age of five to 14, I was what you would consider a Sunday morning believer. Like I was just, went to church, but that was about it. I, I really didn't have any impact upon uh, the lives of others. I was more self-focused, uh, selfish. Don't say amen, Michael. <laughs> you know, just typical teenager. And uh, at the age of 14, God led me to a new school. I switched uh, to a Christian private school, and I really got serious about my faith, and I heard the Bible every day, chapel once a week. So at the age of 14, I surrendered my life to whatever God had. So you would say Jesus was my Savior at five, but I really didn't surrender to his lordship until I was 14. And I just want to throw this out that the Christian journey is a, uh, it's a, it's a progress. It's, it's something that we're obviously growing daily. So if you're not as far as you want to be, guess what? Keep making steps forward. Keep making steps of progress. So fast forward, when I was 14, something changed inside of me when I surrendered. 
And it was kind of awkward to be 14 to have this, but I, I felt the desire to teach and to preach. So I remember asking the principal of the private school, hey, can I give a devotional? So at 14, he let me teach in front of, it was a small school of like 50 students. And my first sermon was stop, drop, and roll. It was a stop what you're doing. You need to stop sinning. Drop down on your knees and pray to Jesus and then roll on. God's got a plan for that was That's the best I could come up with at 14. And um, at 15, I asked my pastor, I was like, will you let me give the Sunday morning sermon, which was kind of a bold ask, but he let me do it. Uh, he let me do it, and at 15, I preached my first Sunday morning sermon, and I was so long-winded even then, don't say amen, but I was so long-winded even then, they let me come back Sunday night and do a part two, and I was, at that moment, I'm like, I'm going to do this the rest of my life. So fast forward 25 years later, we come to this moment in the church's history. Now, something I was sharing to my wife that many of you don't know is that a little over, it was about 12 years ago, I started a church called Relate, and it was the idea of relating to people where they're at, sharing the good news with them. And after about four years, there were some challenges that happened, and it was basically the death of a dream. I basically gave the church up to another leader, walked away, and I walked away with a limp. And I felt like my dream had died. I felt like what God had given me that it was, it was taken from me, and I just felt so, so broken. You ever be, be there where, like, the dream, it was there, and then it's gone? So this is almost 10 years, not quite to the day, that Radiant Church is basically picked up where the dream left off. And when I launched Relate, it was in Arden. It was in South Asheville. So, like, this is the redemptive work of God. He brought me full circle 10 years later after the dream died, and now the dream's more alive than it's ever been before. And that's the way God works. When God gives you a vision or a dream, sometimes it seems like it's dead, but sometimes it takes a death for a resurrection to occur. Amen? So Isaiah 43, and again, welcome to all of our guests. We want you to feel right at home. We want to talk about the vision of Radiant Church. So let's look at verse 13 in Isaiah 43. Uh, starting in verse actually 14. It says, thus, there we go, we got the lights on so you guys are awake. I thought I was going to bring coffee down the aisles to wake you up. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives, the Chaldeans who rejoice in their ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. So if you will do a Google study of when Isaiah lived, Uh, We're talking about the 700s B.C. So he is prophesying an event that happened. Uh, Israel was taken captive in around 586 B.C. And if I remember correctly, they were in captivity for around 70 years. So Isaiah is prophesying this more than 100 years before it happens to Israel. Isn't that fascinating prophecy? So if there's any skeptics here or I'm not sure about the Bible, just study prophecy. There are so many prophecies that are predicted, hundreds, even thousands of years, and then it happens, and you're like, that was so specific. So it's amazing. In verse 16, it says, Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power, they shall lie down together, they shall not rise. They are extinguished, they are quenched like a wick. So what this is referring to is if you guys remember uh, Pharaoh, he had the children of Israel in bondage. I remember as a child, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, let my people go. Uh, It was like a song. For those of you who didn't grow up in church, you'll have to forgive me, but we learn this in kids' church. So the children of Israel were released. They came up into the Red Sea. And the problem is Pharaoh came with his chariots and the sea was in front. And Moses lifted his rod and what happened to the Red Sea? It, It parted. So Isaiah refers Israel back to their history and said, as good as that is, I I want you to get this. Look at the next verse. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Now, if if I'm a Jew and I'm not, I would be offended at this. Like, God, I can't remember the past. I mean, don't we celebrate Passover every year? Forget about it. Are you kidding me? Do you really mean forget? Like, don't remember? We're gonna talk about what it means. He says, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. 
So pause there a second. What do wild animals have to do with God delivering his people? That seems kind of bizarre, right? The owls, the ostriches, the wild animal, like what? So it's okay to pause and be like, well, what, is he, what are you talking about? Because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen, my people. This people I form for myself, they shall declare my praise. Let's pray over God's word. Father, we are grateful for your word. We're grateful for prophetic writings like Isaiah. And as we've studied Revelation and seen prophecy come to life, we go back in Isaiah and we see prophecy even of history, how you predicted it before it happened. So Father, I pray that you would speak to each person here, those listening online, that they would know that the future is as bright as the promises of God, that you would speak to their spirit personally, that not only do you have a vision for this church, but you got a vision for them personally. So Father, we pray that your blessing would be upon this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So today on this first Sunday of Radiant Church, I wanna give you five components of a compelling vision. And I wanna to speak to you individually because I believe every human soul has a purpose, has a plan. But as I speak to you individually, I wanna talk about the church. And we're gonna talk about that at the end. What is the vision for this house, this church? So the first compelling component is number one, a compelling vision starts with the correct view of God. So if you go back to verse 14, it says, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. So you see that God is the Lord. The idea of God being the Lord is the idea that God keeps his promises. We have a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God. So when he makes a promise to you, it's going to come to pass. It may not come to pass when you think it, it's going to come to pass, how, uh, the circumstances, but when God makes a promise, he comes through. But your responsibility is to follow him because God can give you a promise, but sometimes there's a condition, if you will follow me. It's like, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn from the wicked ways, then I will do this. Well, there's a promise, but sometimes there's a conditional aspect. So Israel had to know that they were following false gods and eventually they would be carried away into Babylonian captivity. But in that far country, if they would turn their hearts back to God, guess what? He would hear them and he would eventually set them free from captivity. So let's look at this view of God. What should our view of God be? First of all, God is the Lord and he's a redeemer. The idea of redemption is that God steps into time and space he pays the price to set you free. And we know this, he did this time and again for the Israelites in the context of this passage. But did you know that he's done it for us? Jesus, the eternal son of God, stepped into time and space and he paid for the price for you and I. What, what did he do by paying the price? What did he give up? He gave up his life, right? That's why the emblem of the cross is so paramount to the Christian faith because Jesus paid the redemption price so that you and I could be set free. So he knows where you're at. Some of us are still in captivity and bondage, and Jesus came to set us free. How many of you have ever done pottery before? Raise your hand. All right, some of you have done pottery. Well, there's a type of pottery that I was not familiar with. It is Japanese art, and what they do is they take broken pieces of pottery, something that's broken, and instead of discard it, they make something new out of it. So this, this art form is just fascinating. It's called kintsukurai, and it means golden repair, and we have this on the screen. So what, in kintsukurai, what they do is they take broken pieces, and they make a golden resin. It's kind of like glue. So they take two pieces broken, they use this golden resin and whenever it dries, whenever the light hits it, the brokenness has a beautiful golden glimmer in, in the seam. And isn't that what God does to you and I? You and I are just cracked pots. We are cracked, broken pots. And whenever we come to Jesus in our brokenness, he doesn't keep us broken. It's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. So something I, I encourage the church to remember, the church is like a hospital, right? Jesus said, I haven't come to call the the healthy, I've come to call those who realize they're sick, right? All of us have a sickness called sin. Some of us realize it, some of us don't. But in order to be saved, the first step is to acknowledge that you're a sinner. No, no one likes to do that, right? 
But when you acknowledge that, what God does, and keep in mind, all of us are broken. All of us need grace. All of us need forgiveness. Can I get amen? All of us need that. What, what happens is his grace brings the pieces together. His grace fills in the gaps. And that's why Paul in the New Testament says, we have this treasure. Someone say treasure. We have this treasure in jars of clay so that the excellency of Christ may be of him and not of us. In other words, we realize we are broken, but Jesus takes broken things and he makes them beautiful. So that's the idea of redemption. And notice how God reveals himself. I am the holy one. The idea of holiness is something that's separate, something that's untainted by sin. Jesus is the only one that's, that can say that he lived on earth and was holy. The rest of us, the only way we can be holy is to receive what Jesus did on the cross. Paul said it like this, that God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that through him we might become the what? The righteousness of Christ in him. That's the gospel. So here's the idea. In American Christianity, many churches are trying to make God in their own image. Like, God, I want you to be like me so it's easier to worship you. Now, a God that's made in your own image is not a God. That's a God of your own imagination. What we have to do is go back to the Holy Scriptures and see what God is really like. Instead of trying to change God to fit myself, I change myself to line up under him and realize, God, I am not perfect. God, I have fallen short. So what I do is I kneel at the cross and I confess that I'm broken, but God, will you make me holy? Will you make me righteous? So that way I can acknowledge you are the holy one. God is also our creator. Notice the next thing, the creator. What does it mean to be the creator? That God made you with a purpose. God made you with a plan. I love Max Lucado's quote that if God had a fridge in heaven, your picture would be on it, right? He's your creator. Now, something that pop psychology gets wrong, they say we are all God's children, right? How many of you ever heard that we're all God's children? Survey says, eh, we're all God's creation and he loves us, but God only has one eternal son. That's Jesus. The rest of us are adopted into the family. So God wants to adopt us, but we have to recognize he's, he's the creator, but he wants us to be his child. In John 1.12, it says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. So how do, you get, how do you become from a creation to a child? You're adopted into the family. Notice the next phrase in, in this verse. We're still in verses 14 and 15. It talks about, I am the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One. And he says, for your sake, I will bring them down as fugitives. Talking about the, the Babylonians. In verse 15, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. So here's, here's the distinction. Most of us love the fact that Jesus is Savior, right? How many of us like the fact that he's king? If you acknowledge Jesus is king, it means that he gets to rule your life. How many of you want someone else telling you what to do? Only those who have surrendered to him can say, yes, the rest of us are like, I, I love the get out of hell free pass, right? But Jesus is as, as king? And this goes to Romans 12, 1, if you're taking notes. Paul writes to the church at Rome and he says, therefore, brethren, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, right? And the idea is they were already Christians. They knew Jesus as Savior, but they had not yet surrendered to him as Lord. So going back to this correct vision, it starts with a view of God. He is creator. He's king. He's Lord. And if you start with the correct theology, it will change your life. It will change how you live. It will change how you view yourself. It will change how you view the church. All right, number two, a compelling vision, second component. It doesn't live in your past victories. It doesn't live in your past victories. If you look at verse 16, it says, Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters. So here's the idea. God can make a way where there is no way. You think about the parting of the Jordan River. You think about the parting of the Red Sea. All that God had done through history, it was powerful. But you know what? God says, don't stay there. You, you, you love the good moments in, t in life where God comes through, but don't stay there. Don't live in past victories. How many of you have a sports team that used to be good back in the day? Think about Atlanta Braves fans. Just, sorry, a little painful. But back in the 90s, they were killing it, right? 
Don't throw a baseball at me. But, you know, certain sports teams come and go, and sometimes we live in the glory days. Someone in the first service quoted all this about Atlanta Braves, and I was like, see, you're still, you're still in the good old glory days. So sorry for Braves fans out there. So here's the thing. God wants us to remember the past in a way that we celebrate it, we acknowledge. I mean, keep in mind, they, they did Passover every year. But remember, when he says don't remember, it doesn't mean you throw it away. He's talking about don't live there anymore because God is the great I am, right? He revealed himself in Exodus as I am, not the great I was back in the day. I, I'm right now. I'm doing something special right now. So when you think about past victories, it should grow your faith for even greater victories in the future. So I, I want you just to pause for a moment and think about the greatest thing God's done for you. What is that? What is the greatest thing he's ever done for you? Salvation, right? Think about the greatest victory you have in your life, whatever that is. What if God speaks to you today and says, as great as I've done in the past, I'm about to do something brand new. So I want you not to live just in focus in the past, but listen to this, I'm making a way. I'm making a path through the waters. I'm making a way through the sea. So God can turn a roadblock. Think about a roadblock. He can turn it into a ramp. God can turn a setback into a launching path. Sometimes the worst thing that ever happened to you, God's going to bring into the best thing that happened for you. And you're like, that's impossible. Well, think about the worst event in human history. It was the cross, right? From a human standpoint, killing a perfect person is like the worst event. But think about from our side of the cross. It's the greatest thing that ever happened. So God can take the worst thing that could ever happen and bring something beautiful out of it. And the same is true for your life. And I'm not minimizing what's happened to you. By no means, I would never do that. I'm not minimizing your pain. I'm not minimizing the hurt. But what I am saying is God can raise dead things back to life. God can take your hurts and he can take your scars and he can turn your scars into stars. He can take your wounds and turn them into wings, cause to you to soar to new heights in your spiritual journey. All right, the third component of a compelling vision is a compelling vision is so big that it eclipses your past victories. So look at back at verse 18. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. So here's the paradox. God changes not. How many of us believe that God changes not? All right, and the reason why he doesn't change, truth doesn't change. So if it was true when it was written in the Bible, it's still true today. Truth doesn't change. So here's something you can write down. When it comes to truth, if it's new, it ain't true. When it comes to truth, if it's new, it ain't true. So someone that just discovered something true, God's like this. If it's new, it ain't true. That's bad English, but good theology. God doesn't change. Truth doesn't change. But what does change is how he relates in each situation. What does change is the culture is changing. And what God wants us to do is take the never-changing truth in an ever-changing world and what we have to think like is missionaries. We have to think like missionaries in the culture. And that's so hard because some of us who are more conservative in, in theology, we're also very like antiquated in methodology. And what's happening is really good churches are closing down. I just heard about a church a Friday night, another church in the area closed down. And it's like, it's not that they're not teaching the truth. It's you have to remember that you're a missionary. A missionary learns to speak the native language of the people. And they don't change the message, but they change the methods on how they reach the people. So at the end of this service, I just want to let you know, I'm going to commission all of you to be modern day missionaries. Where you live, where you work, where you play, where you're retired, where you go grocery shopping. Because the vision for this church is God's going to do something new, but you've got to realize you can't stay stuck in the past. And we're going to talk more about that in a bit. So God says, behold, I'm doing something new. Don't, don't dwell in the past. So I want to pre present five reasons why you and I resist change. Now, I know you don't resist change, but the person next to you might, right? It, it's less personal if it's the person next to you. So look at the person next to you and say, this is really for you, not for me. I'm saying this tongue-in-cheek, okay? It's for all of us. But the exception to this rule is if you are an entrepreneur, an inventor, 
you like new things. How many entrepreneur inventors do we have in the place? We had some in the first service. Okay, you like change because you see the picture. For the rest of us, non-entrepreneur, non-visionaries, we resist change. So what I want to do is give you five reasons why. And all five may not apply to you, but probably one of these will. The first one is nostalgia. What is nostalgia? The good old days, right? Now, the question is, were the good old days that good, or do you have selective memory? It's so interesting that some people in dating relationships, their ex-boyfriend, girlfriend was either the greatest thing or the worst thing that ever happened because of selective memory. Now, listen, there's a reason why you broke up. It wasn't working. So don't glamorize how good it was. It wasn't that great, okay? So nostalgia. The other, the other reason we resist change is comfort. When something's new, it's often uncomfortable, right? The idea is I know what I know, and I don't know what I don't know. And I don't want to be uncomfortable. How many of us could relate to that? I could, I could relate to that. The problem with comfort, does God ever promise us comfort in this world? Does he ever promise it in the Bible? What does is, what is Jesus say in John 16, In this world you will have trouble, tribulation. Not might. So if we're seeking comfort, I'm sorry, Christian, but that's not this world. This is for the next world, okay? All right, the third one is sacrifice. As you age a bit, this becomes an, can become a, a temptation. The idea of sacrifice is I know what it takes to produce change, and I'm just not willing to make the sacrifice anymore. I've heard people uh, in different situations where they'll be like, you know, I know what it's like. I've had my children. I served in the nursery, but guess what? I'm not going to serve in the nursery again. I paid my dues. <laughs> what is that? I don't want to sacrifice. I mean, you could do anything, but the idea of sacrifice is it just, it, it's just going to cost a lot. Now, let's go back to the Bible. What is the Christian faith all about? It's about the sacrifice of Jesus, right? So if Jesus gave his all, is me not wanting to do, is that a valid excuse for not wanting to change? Ouch, I'm stepping on toes. All right, I do with a smile. The other one, and I'm not going to ask anyone to raise their hand because this is personal, is selfishness. What is selfishness? Selfishness is the attitude, I don't care if you don't like this, I like it, and I don't want to change. We may not say it that bluntly, but how many have heard people live that way? I don't care if you don't like this, it's good for me. And here's the thing about selfishness. For those of you who don't know, I used to be a youth minister, I used to work with children, so I have some goofy illustrations sometimes, just forgive me, it's because I used to be a children and a youth pastor, okay? But here's one of the examples that's always stuck with me is whenever you think of selfishness, I want you to think about fish, smelly fish. Now, if I had a dead fish three days old, it would be a smelly fish. So whenever you're selfish, here's the root word, selfishness, you are like a smelly fish. Can you guys remember that? All right, it's starting to smell, so I'll move on. All right, what's number five? Let's do number five. This is the most popular with some of us, it's the good enough philosophy. If it's not broke, don't. If it was good enough for grandma, it's good enough for... Let me ask you a question. Do you really believe that? If you believe that, let me ask you a few questions. How many of you still cook all of your meals on an open fire? Anybody? How many of you still wash your clothes in the creek? How many of you still use an outhouse as your primary bathroom usage? So here's the thing, that was good enough for grandma, but for some reason, we, when it comes to methodology, we still keep this for the church. Hey, it was good enough, and it's like, well, sometimes the methods have to change, even though the message doesn't, because God is doing something new. So these are five reasons why we resist change. But what we got to realize is Isaiah says, he's speaking the words of the Lord, he says, do not remember, don't dwell on the past. He says, because I'm doing something new. Look at the next verse. Behold, I will do a new thing. So the fourth component of a compelling vision is a compelling vision paints a picture of what could be and should be. When Isaiah says, I am doing something new, now it shall spring forth. I want you to think about the power of now. Someone say now. Sometimes God's now seems to take a long time, right? You're like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. But when God says now, it means that he's doing something presently. You may not be able to see it, but it's happening now. Right now, around the world, Christians are gathering for worship. Right now, not just in this location, but all, churches all around the world, 
People are going from death to life now. People are going from darkness to light now. People are going from sorrow to joy now. People are going from mourning to rejoicing now. People are going from ashes to beauty now. People are going from despair to hope now. Right now, God is doing a work globally. Right now, we just see a small little speck right here, what he's doing in Arden. Isaiah says, now it's springing forth. Now. Someone say now. Now. So that brings us to the fifth component of a compelling vision. A compelling vision is bigger than one's greatest imagination. So I love, if you'll take your Bible and look back at verse 19, I love the scripture. There's a reason why, every, and I, just so you know, at Radiant Church, we believe every word in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. We even believe the maps in the back. I mean, that's how inspired, that's kind of a joke, but you know. So he says, I will even make a way in the wilderness. God will make a way where there's no way. Before, he made a way in the waters, the parting of the Red Sea, the Jordan River. Now, instead of making a way in the waters, he's going to make a way in the wilderness. And he says, rivers in the desert. So here's the thing. When God gives a vision, he makes provision for the vision. When you're in a desert, say in Babylon, and you have to go back to Israel, what are you going to need along the way when you're in a desert? You're going to need H2O so I can go, you know. I need some water, okay? I need some water. And rivers in the desert. And here's where it gets awkward. I mentioned this at the very beginning. The beast of the field will honor me. The jackals and the ostriches. So it's like, okay, you're, you're delivering God's people out of Babylonian captivity. 586 B.C., Jerusalem got carried away. They're in captivity, then they got to go back. So what's the deal with jackals and owls and ostriches and wild animals? Like, someone, someone say, what's the deal? So here's the idea. In the desert, you have desert animals. Think of owls and think of all these wildlife when you're, in a, when you're in the desert, you're an animal, and you're thirsty, what do you crave the most? Water. So here's the picture. Here's the picture. God is saying, I'm going to bless my people so much, the overflow is going to be so great, it's going to pour out onto wild animals, literally. <laughs> so it's like, well, what does that mean? It means what it means. Literally, that's what it means. But I think there's an application. The application is there's going to be wild people in your life, okay? There's going to be people that are cray-cray, people that just are EGR. Let me define the extra grace required. There are going to be people in your life. And what God wants to do, Jesus referred to himself as the living waters. And whenever you give your life to Christ and surrender, guess what? That living water flows through you. The Holy Spirit lives in you. So he wants to, not just the children of Israel, but has application to you, he wants to pour out his presence in your life so much the overflow begins to spill out onto others. They're like, why are you so joyful today, Jesus? Why are you so excited today, Jesus? Why do you got a little spiritual swagger in your step, Jesus? Why are you so kind to me when I'm so mean to you, Jesus? So here's the thing. He's going to overflow. He's going to overflow. And the result is the people I have formed for myself, verse 21, they shall declare my praise. So the idea behind it is when God's people receive God's blessing, the praise goes back to God. He gets all the credit. So whatever God does at Radiant Church, it's going to be for his glory and his story. We're just small little parts of this huge global church. So it brings us to the question, what is the vision for Radiant? Someone say, what is the vision? Don't you love that logo? So beautiful, yes. The vision for Radiant Church. You ready? It's going to be to lead people from darkness into into light. And our vision, what we did several years back, we drew a five-mile radius, and obviously our vision is beyond Arden, but starting the light that shines the brightest has to shine the brightest at home, okay? So we want to start on the home base, and five miles of this church are about 60,000 people approximately. And pre-COVID, it was like 70% of them didn't go to church anymore. Post-COVID, you know that number has to be up. We don't know the exact stats. I would guesstimate probably 80-plus. So here's the idea. When you get stuck in traffic on Long Shoals, on Hendersonville Highway, on Airport Road, on Sweeten Creek, how many of you get stuck in traffic? These are people that we're trying to reach. So when you you are stuck in traffic, say a prayer. Say for the prayer person before you, behind you, 
Because our, our goal is by the end of 2026, we want to reach 1%. And that may not seem like a big number, and it's not, but that's 600 people. And these are people who live, work. These are people who live and die in this community that our goal is for every man, woman, student, and child to have a chance to receive the gospel. Now, they may reject it, but we want to at least give them an opportunity. And once they come to this church, here's what our discipleship pathway looks like. It's really four things, if you'll follow along your listening guide. The first of all is active in worship. The idea with Sunday, Sunday is like a gathering of believers for a spiritual meal. You guys realize that when you go to your small group, that when you worship God, that when you hear a message, it's a spiritual meal being served. And if you begin to skip on Sundays, you become spiritually starving. Now, I know you need to be a self-feeder, yes, but there's something unusual happens when God people come together for worship. And I just want to encourage you, whenever you miss church, you miss church. So don't get in the habit of missing church because you're going to miss something special. And whenever you're traveling, guess what? We have online. You can still connect. So once you're in worship, the second is to join a radiant group. What is that? That's a small group. Because while we gather and worship in rows, we connect in circles. So here's the thing. Can I give you a little secret? The people that have left this church uh, and over the past five years, now some had you know, different reasons, but many of them, not all of them, but a high percentage of them were in a small group. So I've got a new saying, if you're out of community, you'll eventually be out of the church. If you're out of community, you'll be out of the church. As important as Sunday is, your group is kind of like your, your spiritual family. They, they pray with you. If you're sick, they do meal trains. So I just want to encourage you, if you're not in a group, try one. Try, try different groups out. And then once you're in a group, the second, second thing, the third step, is to use your gift serving and giving. And the idea is everyone has a spiritual gift. God has gifted you. And your gift is not to be sat upon. It's to be used for the building of the body. So here's the goal is find out where you're gifted. If you don't know, Amy's really good at helping people find their gift. We have spiritual gifts tests. And we'll get you connected to a serve team. And then Mark did a great job, Mark Bennett, this past week about the 90-day challenge. What's the 90-day challenge? It's find a serve team. Try at least once a month to volunteer in some capacity. And then if you're not actively giving financially, this is God's money, God's resources for 90 days. It's the only place in the Bible where God says challenge him and it's giving. And I can assure you with five kids and a big family, I've never went without. Whenever you put God first, he provides for the rest. And then the byproduct for those who are worshiping in a group, they're serving and giving, the natural byproduct is you begin to multiply yourself spiritually. So every year, you're like, what's the vision of the church? Every year, it's each one, reach one. Let's say it together. Each one, reach one. So who's your one? Who's the one person you're trying to reach? You know, it's easy to say, I can't reach everybody. 60,000 is overwhelming, right? But is it overwhelming to think about one person? Who's the one person you're reaching? So that's kind of the discipleship pathway. And we don't have time to go on the, the five big objectives, but briefly, how are we going to do this, Timothy? Number one, we're going to proclaim the gospel. We're going to do this in our city, our community. We're going to do it missionally around the world because we believe the gospel has the power to change lives. And Paul in Romans 1.16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And we're not ashamed. We're going to say it, spray it, will it, deal it, make people feel it. We're going to give the gospel out. Amen. I could have been a cheerleader, but I wasn't. All right. Number two, we're going to produce and equip multiplying disciples. The goal is not converts. The goal is not just someone to walk in an aisle, pray a prayer, and that's it. The goal is for you to be discipled. What does it mean to be discipled? It means to follow Jesus. It means that we equip you and empower you to read the Bible daily, to talk with God daily, to be in groups, to, to be accountable. So being part of a church family is not just you check a box. It's saying, when I join this church family, I'm willing to be accountable. I'm willing for you to call me out if I'm in sin. That's biblical, by the way. If, if you catch someone else in sin, the goal is to bring them back. All right. Number three, this is one of the staff's favorite, invade the 167. There are how many hours in a week? 168. A lot of times we focus on the one hour on Sunday, and we should highly value the one hour, but what about the 167 outside of Sunday? What about all the time you spend outside of church? So here's our goal. We want to invade the 167. For those of you who are on your phone four hours a day, we want to stop the scroll. 
We want to get inside your phone and, oh, here's Joe, and he's got another devotional, and what's going on with the beard this week? Oh, now he's got a devotional. Like, we're trying to stop the scroll, you know? And there, there's creative ways of doing it. Uh, we want to go where you live, work, and play. We want to invade. So the idea is all of us are missionaries. And at the end of the service, I'm going to commission you fresh and new to be a missionary of the gospel of Jesus. And number four is empower and raise up leaders. Because it's hard to have a church if you don't have a leader. So if you have a leadership gift, please let us know. In, in the future, we hope to have programs and processes on how to develop these leaders so that you can help us lead the church as we grow. And finally, the byproduct at the end of this five-year vision, 2026, is we would love to launch one new location. You're like, what does that mean? It's not the typical model you think of where I'm on screens all over the place. That's not the primary goal. The goal is taking churches that are dying and instead of letting that church fire, that wick blow out, that candle blow out, that candle be extinguished, we want to send people into that place, a, a, a live pastor. And what will keep us together, we're going to preach on the same passage. So as you know, we go verse by verse, verse through books of the Bible. So if we're, we're in Revelation 5 next week. The other location will be in Revelation 5. And we'll share resources. We'll work together. So that's, that's the vision because we realize churches are closing all over the place. And we want all true Bible-believing churches to thrive. So our vision is what God has done here we want a grassroots movement where he does it other places. Amen? So how many of you are ready to be modern-day missionaries with the gospel? Amen. Yes, let's throw the big idea on the screen, and we're going to close with this. I can hear some stomachs rumbling for lunch. So here's the big idea. The one, to summarize Isaiah 43, the vision, everything we talked about into one sentence, it's this. God is calling us to something exciting and new. And here's the reality. My wife hasn't seen me this excited in a long time. I'm, I'm an excited person, but like I've got some like some pump and pep, and I mean I'm walking different. I got so you can hear it in my voice, and it's because I see God doing something. I see it, and a lot of you have been sensing this for years. That you've been telling me something's coming, something's coming, and I have a declaration that something is here. God is starting a movement right here, and you guys are on the front row. You guys are at the beginning of a new chapter. So this is day one of something huge that's about to happen. And just get yourself ready. There will be a spiritual attack. There will be anytime you step up, the enemy doesn't like it. But you know what? It's worth it all. It's worth all the sacrifice you and I will give. And here's the something new. We're going to lead people from darkness into light. So a little disclaimer. As we grow, some of you may get uncomfortable. Some of you may experience people that you never thought would come to church, but guess what? We love them. We welcome them. We're a hospital. We're going to give them the truth. And just like we receive the truth and change, people in our community need that. So I want to empower you to think differently. Don't think of like, wow, look at all this diversity. I want you to think of it. God is bringing people from darkness into light, but it takes patience. The, the idea is that Jesus called us to be fishers of men. We catch the fish, but who cleans them up? He does. A lot of times, churches like, you get cleaned up, then you can, you know, be welcome. No, we accept you the way you are. That's why we say belong, then you believe, then you become. So we are leading people from darkness into light. Who's ready? All right, let's stand up. I want everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes. I had you all stand because this is not just the, the first Sunday of Radiant. This is a commissioning service. And I wish we had time for everyone to come forward, but with the audience this size, we don't. But what I want to do is commission you. The Bible says that we're all called to go and make disciples. That's all of us. We're already commissioned. But sometimes we have to be reminded of that. So, Father, right now, I just want to commission Radiant Church and those who are watching online as well to do what you called us to do almost 2,000 years ago, to go and make disciples of all nations, starting right where we live, work, and play. So, Father, I commission this wonderful beauty, beautiful bride of Christ, I commission this body, your church, to be missionaries, modern-day missionaries, and Lord, I pray that we would be commissioned to lead people from darkness into light. 
from being in a state of being lost to being found by Christ, to a state of brokenness to a state of repair, from bondage to freedom, from despair to joy, from ashes to beauty. And Lord, I know it's not always easy, it's not always comfortable, but you didn't call us to comfort. You called us to go and win the world for Jesus. So Lord, I commission each person. While you're still standing, continue to pray. Is there one here today that you've never received the gospel? We present it every week, but you never really come to the cross and said, I'm a sinner and I need the Savior. You can't get saved until you first realize you're a sinner, that you need Jesus. Like, you don't need him until you realize it, right? Like, you need him, but you've got to come to the cross and say, I need you. If that's you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I just want you to say this prayer. Truly mean it. Say, Jesus, I acknowledge that you're the Savior. I do believe you died on the cross and rose again the third day. And Jesus, I'm coming to the cross to confess I'm a sinner. I am broken, and I am in need of repair. So Jesus, I'm willing not to ask you to follow what I want, but I'm gonna follow what you want from this day forward. I'm gonna follow you as a disciple. So Jesus, come into my life and forgive me of all my sins. Father, thank you that now you're bringing people from death to life, from darkness to light. Lord, we commit Radiant Church and consecrate this church with all its rich history, almost 70 years, starting a new chapter, we commit it to you. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said, amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for joining us today at Radiant Church Online. We hope that you were encouraged, inspired, and challenged by the message today. We would love to get to know you, so please take that next step. Maybe it's sending us an email to introduce yourself. Maybe it's signing up to be baptized if you've never been baptized. If you have prayed to receive Christ during the service, please let us know. You can find all those details at radiant828.com and click on the I'm New tab and you can take your next step. Well, I just want to encourage you to join us again next week as we continue to study God's Word. If you would like to give a donation, a tithe, an offering, a gift to the church, you can do that safely and securely online. And again, that that website address is radiant828.com. I look forward to seeing you next week. And remember, in Christ, the best days are not back here. The best days are right in front of us. We'll see you, God willing, next Sunday.